the Lord your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, says, I am the Lord your God who teaches you for your benefit, who leads you in the way you should go. Make your ways known to me, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. I wait for you all day long. The Lord is good and upright, therefore he shows sinners the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches them.
to you with our hearts open for the message that's delivered through Chris. Lord, I just pray that the Holy Spirit will just speak through Chris in a mighty way and that each of us will not just hear the words that are preached, Lord, but that we will take them to heart and that we'll apply them to our life. Thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. church. It's a beautiful day, is it not? Yes. All right. Turn with me in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, we're going to look at the last portion of the chapter today. You know, I got me to thinking about this this morning as I was studying and preparing for today. You know, I got me thinking, you know, if, it's a big word, obviously, if, if, there is no God, then there's no judge, right? And if there's no judge, then there's not going to be a final judgment, right? And if there's no final judgment, then ultimately there is no meaning to life. <laughs> Nothing matters. So this is the logic that Arthur Miller gives in one of his books that he writes in, in accordance to Ecclesiastes titled After the Fall. You know, if there's no God to judge the world, then our existence is pointless. It's pointless litigation that ends in meaningless despair. Because we see with Kueth, we see with the preacher's first and last words in Ecclesiastes. He says, vanity of vanities, everything, all is vanity. He says that in chapter 1, and he says it again in chapter 12, verse 8. But this is his evaluation of life where? It's life under what? Under the sun, right? So in the end, what do we have? We have nothing. So what I want us to do today is I want us to look at verses 8 through 14 together. So if you've got your Bible, you've opened there. I encourage you to, to read along with us. If not, you can follow along on the screen. But as always, let's stand together in the honor of the reading of God's word. It says this. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many problems with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. And keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment. With every secret thing. Whether good or evil. Let's pray. Heavenly Father we thank you. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your goodness and your provision. Father we thank you for the privilege that it is to be gathered here today. Lord God I thank you for the opportunity to come before you in praise and worship. Lord, to sit at your feet. Father, I pray that you would continue to have a seat among us this morning. Father, this is your time. This is your service. Father, we are your people. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would have, continue to have open minds, to have moldable hearts. Father, that your word would fall on fertile soil, God, that he who has ears, let him hear. 
Father, we love you and we praise you. For it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. You can be seated. See, this morning I want to look at a few different aspects of the, just these six verses together. Understanding what he said, how he said it, why he said it. Just some different aspects when it comes to just the ending of this chapter, the ending of the book itself. So I want to start off with what he said, with what the preacher said. Kuith. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. A statement that he makes to express the futility of life in a fallen world. See, when you go back and if you look at chapter 11, if you look at how Kuith addresses the young, he's addressing them, telling them to say, you know what, it's okay to, to pursue the things of life, but as you pursue these things, when you look into these things, make sure that as you do them, remember your Creator. Remember your Creator. Because God will bring you into judgment. And as we understand what the preacher is showing us, what he's telling us, we see that he begins again, he begins the book with one statement and he begins the book, or he ends the book with the same statement to reinforce that there's nothing new under the sun in accordance with this life. It's a reminder what King David tells us in Psalm 39, verses 5 and 11, when he says that mankind is but a mere breath. See, you and I, our life is a vapor, right? We're here today, we're gone tomorrow, so to speak, as many people have said, right? But the thing is, is that it's kind of like, uh, have you ever heard of Samuel Barrett? He's a playwright. And he wrote a play entitled Breath. This play is a whopping 35 seconds long. Now, how many of you would pay to go see that? Okay? 35 seconds. And what it does is it starts with a pile of rubbish on the floor. Just a big pile of random stuff. The curtain opens, you see this pile. The light is dim, it brightens a little bit. And then it begins to dim, and then it goes out. And all the while, you hear a soundtrack. And it's someone breathing. They breathe in, they exhale, and then that's it. Sounds like a real winner, doesn't it? <laughs> but really what that is, I mean, it's basically, he's encapsulating what he feels to be how quickly life comes and how quickly life goes. Reticent of what King David says in Psalm 39. But see, what we need to understand is, is that even though Kuwait says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. What we need to understand is, when we started in chapter 1, we're not the same person that we were when we get to the end of the book. I pray. I pray that we're different. That's where Kuwait takes us in this journey of these 12 chapters. We're not the same as when we started reading. Because he wants us to understand as you look through the different chapters, he wants us to understand that life is meaningless without God. Amen? Amen. That there's little joy under the sun if we leave him out. If we live, leave the creator of the universe out. Because here's the thing, the things that we acquire, the things that we do under the sun, 
None of it's ours to keep, right? That's according to Derek, Derek Pinder. So this is what he said. Now, how did he say it? Vanity. See, vanity doesn't get the last word when it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to Scripture. Because up until now, that's what Kuwith has seen. This is what he's showing us. Verses 9 and 10. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. We see how, as you study scripture, you see how the Bible is written, right? And we see with Ecclesiastes, we see a few different understandings. We see logical clarity. We see literary artistry. We see intellectual integrity. I mean, it's written by Solomon, right? When you look at logical clarity, you see phrases like, Chapter 7, verse 13. I mean, he took the time and the trouble to evaluate wise sayings, the Proverbs, and he put them in because he wants us to think about them. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? We see themes in chapter 1, his quest to find meaning from chapter 1 to chapter 6, living for God in a vain world through wisdom and folly from chapter 7 through 11 and then he wraps it all up in chapter 12. We see the literary artistry, words of delight, a beautiful phrase for the beauty of scripture. Thomas Wolfe, an American writer said of Ecclesiastes, he called it the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. But then he also, we see intellectual integrity found in here. He didn't just write for beauty. He wrote for truth. He wrote with these things in mind. He wants to touch our minds. He wants to touch our hearts. He wants to guide us in the wisdom of God. That is why... We see what he said. We see how he said it. But we also need to understand why Kuwith said what he said. Why he said it. Because God, in his wisdom, provides correction and stability, right? When you look at verse 11, it says, The words of the wise are like goads. And like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. The goad meant for an animal. It's not meant to injure. What is it meant to do? Well, it's meant to coax the animal into what? Into cooperation. Ever, you ever seen that on the farm? Maybe you've I'm sure some of you in here have done that before you. I'm okay. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I'm a city boy. Okay. I'm just going to throw that right out there. I studied it. I looked up, okay, what does it go? And I got a pretty good idea of what it is. And I know what you're supposed to do. And I know how you're supposed to do it. But I've never done it. So there you go. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Some of you? Okay, good. Okay, good. So you get that picture, that mental image, right? It's supposed to correct. You're supposed to get the animal to do what you want it to do, right? Well, isn't that what the book of the Lord, the Bible, Scripture is meant for us, right? For people of faith. I mean, there's pleasing words in here, right? But there's also words that at times can seem painful because what does the Lord want us to do? He wants to point us in the right direction. I mean, he wants to help us understand our faith. 
that the things of this world are temporary. That he wants us to put our faith in the goodness of God. Amen? Amen. But not only that, it says there in verse 11, firmly fixed like a nail. To take these pleasurable words, these pleasing words, but not only that, the painful words, the statements, driving them into our mind, driving them into our hearts so that it stays like a nail that's driven into wood. That is why it is so important to be here, right? It is so important to take time here. To have this in your life on a day by day basis. Amen? Amen. Pleasing words like, for everything there's a reason, and time for every matter under heaven. Chapter 3. Two are better than one. Chapter 4. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. Chapter 9. Those are just a few. But then you've got painful words like all is vanity and striving after the wind in verse chapter 1. Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Chapter 7. The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Chapter 12. And see, it's words like these, both pleasing and painful. They're nailed to our hearts. They goad us into action. Helping us to follow after the one shepherd. And here's the thing. That one shepherd, some have speculated that it's Solomon. That it's the the preacher. But here's the thing. It's the first time it's mentioned. So most theologians believe, I believe, that it's referencing God Almighty, God Himself. It's distinguishing between the two, and thus you have such an importance when it comes to verse 11, when it comes to biblical doctrine, when it comes to the inspiration of Scripture. If you look at 2 Peter 1.21, it says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. See, what it does here, when you, when you understand the one shepherd, it makes the words of Solomon even that much more important. Because they are the words of God written through Solomon. They're not just musings. They're not just poetry. But they're infallible and inerrant. Coming from God himself. Yes, we admire the integrity. We admire the artistry. But what we're, what we're really called to do is to submit to the authority. Amen. And see, as the shepherd to our souls, God uses this book. He uses the entire canon to prod each and every one of us into spiritual action. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is breathed out by God profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction and for training into righteousness. See, what we understand now even more so is that the shepherd's words take on even greater force when we remember that the shepherd's our savior. That he laid down his life for us. John 10, 11, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for sheep. What he said 
how he said it, why he said it. And in the process of this, understanding that we continue to search, but in the process of searching, we need to remember that we're called to guard our search as well. And that's what he says in verse 12. You know, when you read this book, when you hear the words of God, we're careful to listen, building our lives on it, right? Do you know that there's over a million books published a year? That's a lot of books. How many of you in here read over a hundred books a year? I was looking. I was wondering. <laughs> we got a librarian in our midst. I thought maybe she read over 100 books a year. <laughs> it's a lot. I mean, you know, even 100 books a year is a lot of books. But see, verse 12 says, Of making many books, there's no end, and much study is the weariness of the flesh. But see, Derek Pender states this. He says, The search for wisdom is one that we should strive for. For there is a place in Christian discipleship for the life of the mind. Here's the thing. You and I are called to continue the search for wisdom, right? To continue to build our minds. But in doing so, we've got to be careful. We gotta be careful what we take in, right? Because there's a lot of stuff out there that's not accurate, isn't there? It truly is. We've gotta be careful. But in the process of doing this, one of the things that struck me is to return to the process of being like a child in this. When inquiry meant something. How many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis? Okay. All right. C.S. Lewis said this. Once you were a child. Once you knew what inquiry was for. You asked questions because you wanted answers. And were glad when you found them. Become that child again. But see in this process. When we read books. When we... Seek to acquire knowledge. In all of that process, being careful with what we take into our minds, we cannot put any of them above this. We are to seek spiritual truth. To be content with what God's word tells us in regards to our lives. Amen? What he said, how he said it, why he said what he said. The fact that we're called to guard our search when we seek spiritual truth. All of these things help us when we get to the last two verses in chapter 12. Because we see there, as he states, the end of the matter. Verses 13 and 14 say this, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. See, we see not only ethic, an ethical understanding, but we see an eschatological conclusion, fear God. Keep his commandments, for this is your whole duty. See, it's not the first time we've seen these two statements in the book of Ecclesiastes. Fearing God is a recurring topic. We see it in chapter 3. We see it in chapter 5. We see it in chapter 7. We see it in chapter 8. We're to fear God when it comes to worship. We're to fear God 
in times of adversity and prosperity, when we fear God, what happens? All will go well with us. We see that it's the full duty of man. It literally means it's the whole duty of man, the whole of man. When it comes to the keeping of his commandments, we see the link between fearing God and keeping his commandments. We see it all throughout the book of Deuteronomy. One of the most important, if not the most important thing in life is to worship God and what? Obey his commandments, fearing him. I mean, the whole duty of man it doesn't get much more plain than that. It means that's what we're to be about, right? According to Charles Bridges in Ecclesiastes, a banner of truth, to fear God, worship, and obey his commands is his whole happiness in business, the total sum of all that concerns him, all that requires, that God requires of him. All that the Savior desires of him. And all that the Holy Spirit teaches and works in him. And in regards to the eschatological aspect, we know that there's a time coming. We know that there's a day coming when every one of us will stand in judgment. Everything is going to be exposed, right? There's nothing that we're going to be able to keep secret. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says this, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his condemnation from God. Listen, when we mention judgment, why, why mention it? Well, here's the thing. Because everything matters. Everything matters. I mean, the, the preacher began, he ended his quest by saying that everything's vanity, right? That's how he started. But he helps us understand again that without God, there is no purpose in life. He kept saying, is this all there is? He, that's what he kept asking. Is this all there is? Isn't there more to what I see under the sun? If there's no God, then there's no judgment. If there's no judgment, then, then nothing matters. But if there is God, then everything matters. Here's the thing, church. God in heaven rules the world. And there is life after this one. And thus, significance. So, the final thought is this. It's not that nothing matters, but everything does. What we did, how we did it, and why. Because everything in the universe is subject to a righteous God who knows everything about us. Amen. Would you bow with me? So here's the thing. Everything does matter. Everything does matter because we serve a holy, righteous, all-powerful God. The one and only true living But see, even in the midst of understanding 
that everything matters. What matters most of all is a personal decision to follow Jesus Christ. See, this book, its purpose is pointing us to the gospel. You can see it reminds us of judgment. It does. And it's important for us to make sure that we'll be found righteous on that day, that day of judgment. And the only way to know that we will indeed be found righteous is to put our trust in Him. Maybe you're here today. You've never done that. Something's been holding you back. Today could be the first day the rest of your life. As the praise team sings, we're gonna, the altar's going to be open. We'd love to talk to you about Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Maybe you just need someone to pray with you. I'd be happy to do that as well or grab someone, pray with them right there where you are. But if God is tugging on your heart if he's knocking on the door don't ignore him but as a praise team sings let's stand and sing